It's now my pleasure to introduce the final segment of today's program. My colleague uh, Robert Costa will have a discussion with Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow. Having arrived in this country as an eight-year-old immigrant, our special guest has risen to the highest levels of government and nonprofit service. Secretary Chow's extensive career in government service has included top positions in each of the past three Republican administrations. She was President George W. Bush's Secretary of Labor and served as Deputy Secretary of Transportation, as well as Director of the Peace Corps under President George H.W. Bush. Her career has also spanned private and, non uh, private and nonprofit sector service, including four years as President and CEO of the United Way of America at a very crucial time. I had the pleasure of meeting Elaine during the Reagan administration when she served uh, in a distinguished role as White House Fellow. Since becoming the nation's 18th Secretary uh, of Transportation, Secretary Chow has been tackling a wide range of issues, including repairing and modernizing our nation's infrastructure and working to improve the safety of America's railways and highways. Today, we'll hear about her department's work in the aviation sector. It's now my pleasure to welcome Washington Post national reporter Robert Costa and Secretary Elaine Chow. Good morning, I'm Robert Costa, I'm a national political reporter here at the Washington Post. Honored to have Secretary Elaine Chow, Secretary of the Department of Transportation, former Secretary of Labor, uh, an extensive career in, in federal government, as we all know, and, and in the private sector, President and CEO of the United Way. And I know we could go on for a long time about your backstory, but I thought- I just said to Fred Ryan, I said, you know, what this really means is that I'm really old. No, no, no. <laughs> but I thought, as a reporter who covers the White House, I thought, what's the best way to get through the biography section quickly? And I saw President Trump was with you yesterday, a meeting yes. talking about FEMA. And here's the quote he, he said about Secretary Chow. Quote, all you do is produce. You do it in a quiet way and so effective and so incredible. What a job you're doing with transportation. It was a great decision. Typical President Trump, high praise for his cabinet. And uh, that really shows you are in an influential spot inside of the president's cabinet right now. Uh, and you're also, as well, he yesterday said- Yesterday was really interesting because, um, again, I think it shows how prescient and prepared this administration was to be. So we are approaching hurricane season. And the president and the vice president both appeared, as well as the first lady. They assembled the whole entire cabinet. And we went over um, the preparations for the hurricane season. And we had a number of local and state uh, officials involved, including uh, quite a number of governors. So we did this last year as well. Last year was just um, uniquely different because of the three very, very strong hurricanes that took place one after the other. And uh, so we learned from that, and then we're getting ready for this year as well. So I think this speaks well for the administration. Looking at policy, when, when you look at the move last year, almost a year ago, June 2017, yeah. for privatization of air traffic control, uh, the Republicans in Congress have moved away from pushing for that on Capitol Hill. Do you think there's any chance in the coming year that that push to tr move it from the FAA to a nonprofit corporation could be revived? I want to give um, Chairman Schuster a great deal of credit because if it were not for his uh, single-handed determination in surfacing this issue, in carrying it through the committee process, getting the votes that he did, uh, I don't think this uh, proposal would have as much momentum as it does. Uh, having said that, I think the idea is timely. Because when I was Deputy Secretary of Transportation, I remember sitting around the conference room of then uh, Secretary, then, then Secretary at that time, uh, talking about uh, how do we relieve congestion? How do we reduce delays in the air? And for any traveler now who's traveling, they understand right away 
uh, what it means to be stuck at the airport or to be circulating, uh, you know, to be uh, circling in the skies for quite a while. And so delays and congestions in our airspace is something that almost every passenger understands. And the administration's proposal to take the air traffic control system from FAA and liberate it from the government shackles of the procurement process, which so delays the acquisition of modern, up-to-date, uh, technologically, uh, the best technologically um, in, you know, uh, equipment. Um, this would enable the air traffic control to address some of the delays and the congestions which so many passengers uh, face every single day. And there's always a bit of a conflict that some critics say that the FAA is the government's regulator, safety regulator of the skies. How can it regulate itself? Meaning run the air traffic control and also regulate the safety. So this argument, this argument has been around for quite a while, as has, again, the concerns with about how to alleviate delays and also congestions in our air. And I'll give you another uh, just a very simple example. Our air traffic control system, first of all, let me just reassure everyone, is the safest in the world. We have the best air traffic controller uh, control system in the world, but it's radar based. So the radar system basically sweeps 360 degrees in six seconds. So during those six seconds, we do not have a pinpoint accuracy as to where that airplane is. We know where it is, but there's, we cannot pinpoint exactly where. And so because of that, the planes are spaced further apart for safety considerations. Now, if we had a GPS system, which we all understand these days because we all have our own handheld device, uh, and if we had a GPS-based air traffic control system, we would be able to pinpoint the exact location of that playing and be able to stagger or line up the planes with shorter distances between them. Of course, still very safe, but that will give us greater opportunities to reduce the congestion. So that's just one example as to how the air traffic control system, if it's uh, if it had the most up-to-date uh, systems, technology, can help to reduce delays, uh, increase productivity, of course, because delays mean um, lost productivity and also a deterioration in our quality of life. So again, this idea is going to come back because the need to address delays and congestions in our airspace will continue. Just on the when it comes back, mm -hmm. do you see that before or after the midterm elections as some kind of legislative proposal? <laughs> you know, we are also a department that listens to the will of Congress. And clearly, we have been unable uh, to get enough votes in the House and the Senate. So until we do, uh, this proposal will not gain uh, greater currency. And so you know, we need to work on that. What do you think, Secretary, about the pilot shortage in the industry? And is there any action your department could take to loosen regulations on how air airlines uh, and recruit pilots and to try to help address that problem. This is a very big problem because it's kind of like the perfect storm. You have a generation of experienced pilots who are facing retirement. Uh, we are also seeing increased traffic, air traffic in our airspace. And then of course we have less people going into the military who used to be a tremendous provider of uh, pilots. And we have a tremendous shortage in pilots. And so last year, we launched a program. It was actually the brainchild of a, uh, of a very good staffer, Bobby Frazier, at the Department of Transportation, who saw this problem early and said, we've got to do something about it. And so we launched the Forces Flyers program, in which we give scholarships to people who want to become pilots so that they can gain the pilot training. I mean, it's very expensive 
to personally, for anyone interested in being a pilot, to lay out the money, to gain the, um, the experience, to uh, the requisite experience, to be able to qualify. Uh, there is this 1500 hour rule, which came about because of the tragic accident in upstate New York. And it was a, uh, a, a tragedy of a commuter aircraft that resulted in fatalities. So our hearts go out to the families and the relatives of people who have been lost. But it was because of that that it was thought that not enough hours were accumulated by these commuter aircraft airplane pilots. And so the requirement for the hours required to fly certain types of aircraft was increased. But that has actually uh, made it so much harder for so many other experienced uh, veterans in, in flying to enter this field. This is obviously a very sensitive subject, and until the Congress advises us otherwise, um, it's very hard for us to do anything on that, obviously, because we have to comply with the, the rules and regulations and the law. Just to be clear, would you be open to seeing that number drop below 1,500 at some point after discussions? You know, I, I think there needs to be a robust discussion because obviously we hold the memories of those who are lost in our hearts and we do not ever want to see an accident like that or any accident ever occur. But there is this side effect, uh, unanticipated um, corollary impact of reducing the number of pilots, pilots who can very safely fly in our skies. So I think the Congress needs to have this discussion and we will abide by the wishes of Congress. At, looking at consumer protection, billions are spent every year, uh, earned by the airlines every year on aircraft uh, baggage and reservation change fees. Should the federal government have more oversight over those two issues? Well, we already do. We, in fact, have a consumer protection uh, office, bureau, uh, which is uh, headed up by a very caring and responsible uh, woman. Her name is Blaine. She's here in the back. Uh, and uh, she and others in the department, are, myself included, of course, are very concerned about consumer protection. So we have um, uh, launched a renewed emphasis on know your rights as a passenger. And we have relaunched the Department of Transportation's website on consumer protection because uh, we want people to be able to know what their rights are and if they're at a counter and they don't know what, quite what to do, they can go on the website, draw it up right away, and know what their rights are. And so they can ask uh, for what is rightly uh, due theirs. And then also we, also, you know, we actually inspect airplanes, airports, um, on an unannounced basis. So in 2017, we conducted well over 100 uh, unannounced inspections uh, of 34 um, airlines and over 3,000 airports just on this consumer reaction and treatment point of view. So we, of course, are very concerned about it. Um, baggage claims, fortunately, are uh, way down, uh, but that doesn't help if your, if, if your luggage is lost. So we understand that. And also, we're seeing unprecedented numbers of travelers because of the improved economy. So we want to empower and equip passengers to be able to know what their rights are so that they can fight for themselves. And if that's unsatisfactory, then we also can take up their cause because uh, we, uh, Blaine does um, like casework. We have people who complain, they can't get uh, satisfaction. We will go on their behalf and talk to the airlines or the airports or whoever and try to sort out their... So you don't see the, your department ha trying to regulate in a more bolstered way the fees? We are not the best. We do already, number one. Number two, we should not be the first line. We want the airlines to do their job. And I think as uh, organizations uh, that want to be profitable, be responsive to the public, uh, they need to respond to the complaints, and they do. But sometimes that's not enough, and then, so we want 
the passengers to be empowered to know what their rights are. And we have equipped them with this new relaunched website that will enable them to draw up the information quickly. We do un unannounced inspections. And then if the passengers still are unsatisfied, we can intervene on their behalf. As someone who travels a lot for the Post as a reporter. You're not the only one. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, there's a debate when you're at an, air, uh, an airport among passengers about service dogs versus emotional yeah. support animals. Mm -hmm. What's your, as the Secretary of Transportation, should there be more guidelines about what defines a service dog? We've seen Senator Burr, for example, in North Carolina, Republican proposed legislation to try to make sure only those who align with the American with Disabilities Act get that kind of classification of their animal. Should there be more regulation or more guidelines about how to understand w what these animals' role is in the airport and on aircraft? You know, we want to be supportive of uh, passengers as do airlines uh, who need special assistance because of their disability. We also know that there have been instances in which there have been very disruptive uh, animals who have actually frightened uh, passengers, other passengers, or who have disrupted airline operations. And so the, we, we have been asked to clarify uh, those rules. Uh, the department uh, has come out with uh, announced, it's an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking on service animals. And we are soliciting input from the public and we hope to respond very quickly on this. Concurrent with that, to address the issue of disruptions in the airplane, many times while it's up in the air, uh, we have uh, sometimes, there are sometimes unconventional animals and so they need, that needs to be addressed. And so in the interim, uh, while we work on this advance notice of proposed rulemaking and seek public input, we are saying to the, air, uh, uh, to the um, airlines and the public, and the airlines support this, of course, is that uh, we need to go back to the traditional definitions of what a surface is. So you're saying, uh, for example, if I wanted to bring a peacock onto an aircraft <laughs> as, a, as an emotional support animal, there may be some federal guidelines or regulations coming up that would say, no, Mr. Costa, you cannot bring a peacock onto this flight? We have actually had experiences with not only peacocks, but many others as well, and uh, they can be disruptive. And so <laughs> we want to make sure that passengers who really need the assistance because of their disability have access to them and we want to make sure that uh, they're being handled properly. But there are these other aspects that we want to make sure. And in working with the airlines, uh, we are having these, uh, temp these uh, guidelines and then awaiting the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. So the, that was kind of a lighter note, but I, I know you have to deal with a lot of tragedy. You think about in Southwest Flight 1380 this year, it, it does bring up the question of aircraft repair stations. Uh, should more be done? Is enough being done already? Well, first of all, you know, it is with a, with a sigh that I say that we've actually have been looking at that issue prior to my arrival. I've been told that this issue was being looked at by the FAA for the last uh, 18 months. And at that time, the evidence did not suggest that this was going to be a catastrophic event. So this took its uh, usual process, not slow, but usual process of examination, of um, due diligence, and unfortunately we've had that accident. So we have sped up the, um, the examination of this issue and also put in new um, regulations immediately, telling the airlines that this event has occurred, that they need to take a look at this kind of engine throughout their whole fleet within a discrete period of time, one month. So we are following up on that, and I think airlines don't need that. Um, they don't need that urging, because obviously these accidents are something that they don't want either. So we have definitely sped up the process for rulemaking on this, and then also took immediate uh, kind of like um, a call to action by the airlines that they need to examine immediately all of their aircrafts and report back. 
already uh, this administration has been supportive through your, your department on unmanned drone aircraft exploration innovation what are you what else should we expect on that front you know the government is not the fountain of all wisdom and we don't know which technology would be best but the promise of drone technology automated driving systems self-driving cars are so promising not the least of which they would give people who heretofore have been immobile due to age or disability the freedom once again to reclaim their mobility. So there are so many great things that can happen with new technology. 94% of, of accidents occur because of human error. So somehow if we can introduce greater, um, you know, safer technology, we can actually make safe, uh, driving safer as well. But as we have also seen recently in a number of these accidents, um, the technology is not fail safe. And so how do we regulate as regulators um, in a way that will be tech neutral, not in a, that will uh, ensure, that will promote safety without hampering <laughs> innovation? And we've also got to do this in conjunction with the patchwork of state and local regulations that are arising as well. So we want innovation to occur because innovation is part of America's great competitive advantage and, you know, and uh, competitiveness, but we want to promote safety without hampering innovation. In the final four minutes, I just want to ask you a question about personal question that your name came up in the news recently and then about President Trump. Your brother-in-law and investment manager was recently nominated to lead the yeah. Pension Benefit uh, Guarantee Corporation, which is part of the Labor Department. Did you play a role in recommending his nomination? First of all, I think our country is very lucky to have him because we need accomplished individuals who have a track record of success and yet who have a patriotic fervor to want to serve our country. So it is true that he is my brother-in-law, but Secretary Acosta made the selection and hired him. And I think he's an excellent choice. And I don't think anybody's relations or relatives should be held against them. Certainly not me. <laughs> uh, final question. Maybe we can take the whole three minutes to answer this one. <laughs> President Trump. Oh, I'll just say, I'll, 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 oh. say, I'll, you know, I'll say a little bit more. I can just imagine my media people saying, don't answer that question. Um, no, but uh, Gordon's very accomplished. And also, he's not beholden to the industry. He didn't rely upon his past livelihood on the uh, industry that, he's a, that uh, he will be regulating. He, going forward, will not rely upon this industry for his future employment either. So he's independent, uh, unbeholden to any interest group, and therefore will do what is best for the 44 million retirees uh, in our retirement system. Yeah, that you mentioned and he's independent. That's the only reason I ask the question. Just sometimes people, American people wonder, does, does someone get a job because of their family connection and to, or the recommendation, that's all. Well, he's quite accomplished. He's quite an entrepreneur. He went to Stanford, was valedictorian of his high school class, and he retired before the age of 29 because of his great success. So his is a great uh, American um, story where he came from a middle class background and then became very successful in the high tech area and wants to give back to the country. Looking at President Trump. I, I'm saying that I want there to be harmony at the Thanksgiving dinner table. <laughs> That's a long time from now, so hopefully. Uh, you've seen presidents up close for years. We're now more than a year into this presidency. Has he changed at all from the man who was on that lectern uh, in January of 2017? You know, the president is uh, very passionate about a number of topics. He's very concerned about uh, the infrastructure proposal. We've uh, sent the proposal up to the Congress on February 12th of this year. And we want to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis. Uh, the president is also concerned about uh, the state of our economy, the number of jobs that are created. He does not go very far without always bringing up the subject about jobs. And for the last jobs report that just came out in May to show the unemployment rate to be 3.8%, for the labor participation rate 
to be as robust as it is and uh, to have uh, the number of jobs vac vacant be less than the number of people looking for jobs. Uh, it used to be that the, um, the JOLT study in the Department of Labor showed that there were more vacancies than job seekers. And now we're finding, of course, that more people are coming back into the workforce. And so there are more job seekers because the numbers are, because the environment is better, they think they can get a better job, they can get a job, so that's all coming back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Secretary Chow, for your time. I appreciate it. And, and of course, the stock market is doing great. GDP growth is probably going to hit 3% pretty soon. So, <laughs> And the That's president the is very concerned have. about that. He's very concerned about the no, economy. No, uh, well, we'll keep an eye on all of that, and we appreciate your time very much. And if you want to see highlights from today's program, please visit WashingtonPostLive.com. Thanks to everyone for joining us, and especially Secretary Chow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Can we go off? Thanks a lot.